Welcome to this message by Ray Steadman titled, Strange Fire, from raystedman.org. The text for this message is from Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 7. Now, once again, in the book of Leviticus, we're learning again the great truth which, uh, in the course of history, seems to be lost again and again and then recovered. And when it's recovered, it's always a fantastic power to change a whole civilization. This great truth of the priesthood of every believer in Jesus Christ. Whenever this has been taken seriously by a people, by a church, in any nation, it has always resulted in a tremendous awakening, a fantastic uh, change of, of pace, change of life, and uh, institutions and, and organizations that have been committed to injustice and uh, the uh, deterioration of society have been challenged, disappeared, and uh, much has been recovered under the impact of this truth. When Martin Luther and the reformers of the Reformation spread again the great truth that every believer in Jesus Christ is a priest, and people began to take it seriously, It swept through Europe like wildfire and completely altered the course of European history. And I'm grateful that once again God is in these days calling the church, a sleeping, slumbering church, an evangelical church, which has largely forgotten this truth. It slipped through our fingers. We've lost its impact. Now calling us back to take these things seriously again. Now that's what this book of Leviticus uh, centers on and is teaching us what it means to be be a priest, a member of the royal priesthood with which God has endowed this world and intends to reach it. Now in chapter 9, remember last time together, we saw the results of priesthood. When everything is done as God commanded, as the Lord commanded, the result was a manifestation of the presence of God a remarkable shining forth of the glory of the Lord. And when uh, Aaron and the sons of Aaron, uh, picturing Jesus Christ as the great high priest, and we as the sons of Aaron, joining with him in the priesthood, when uh, uh, they had done all that God had said and fulfilled their priesthood as he had it directed, Then the glory of the Lord broke out in their midst. Now, this is always the case. The glory of the Lord is the character of Jesus, the manifestation of his kind of humanity present in in our daily lives. Now, in chapter 9, as we saw, it ended with a great scene of glory and triumph. The Shekinah glory, the cloud of light, suddenly appearing in the midst of the people of Israel and consuming the rest of the sacrifice in a flash of flame. And the people shouted out and fell on their faces and cried out in triumph. But now the amazing thing, we move immediately from that scene of triumph into a scene of tragedy. And right on the very same day that this tremendous breakthrough occurred in the camp of Israel, tragedy strikes and a sudden and shocking manifestation of judgment occurred. We have it recorded now in the opening verses of chapter 10. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unholy fire before the Lord, such as he had not commanded them. And fire came forth from the presence of the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. The very same Shekinah which had destroyed the sacrifice, consumed the sacrifice, now reaches out in a flash of flame again to destroy these two priests as their ministry. What a shock this must have been to Aaron, to the other sons of Aaron, the other two men that were left, and to the whole of the camp of Israel at this sudden thing that happened. You can imagine Aaron, for instance, watching with pride as these two boys of his, 
two of his four sons, are carrying out their duties as priests, and he watches them fill their censers with glowing coals, and then put incense upon it, go before the presence of the Lord as God had commanded, and then to his sudden shocking amazement, fire reaches out from the cloud of glory, and in a flash, these boys are gone, and he sees their charred, burned, singed bodies lying there on the floor. What a shock. What do you think your reaction would have been if you'd been part of it? The people were stunned and sobered by this manifestation. As far as we can determine, what these boys did was to substitute a different kind of incense than that which God had commanded. Uh, it doesn't seem like very much, but it, it evoked an immediate judgment from God, and their lives were forfeit by this. Now, uh, I don't know why they did it. It may have been that they just seemed to take it for granted that uh, any kind of incense would please God. And perhaps uh, they didn't like the uh, smell of frankincense that God had commanded. Perhaps they personally didn't uh, appreciate that, and so for some reason they substituted something else. That's all. That was their crime. They perhaps preferred uh, some other kind of perfume, Chanel number no. 5, or perhaps my sin. And in offering this, their lives were immediately taken by the flame of God. Now, what is your reaction to that? I wish I could take the time to survey this congregation this morning and ask you to tell me what you emotionally feel when you read this account. I would warrant that probably half of this congregation or more has a sense of uneasiness about this and even if you probe deeply enough, a sense of resentment. You feel God is unfair. Why should he take the lives of these two men for such a trivial thing? And I, I suspect that many of us would, would have a sense of, uh, of resentment, unfairness, even anger at God for this kind of a treatment. Surely if you'd been there, I'm sure this was the reaction that Aaron felt and his other sons as they saw their brothers uh, killed in this way. And I suspect that a lot of people read their Bibles this way. They read these stories of the Old Testament and the judgment of God in similar cases, uh, such as Miriam, the sister of Aaron, who, uh, who did some small thing that seems to be rather trivial, and yet and immediately God uh, judges her with leprosy. She becomes white all over with leprosy. And a little later on is the story of Uzzah, who, you remember, steadied the ark as David was returning it to Jerusalem. And just as he touched it, he dropped dead like that. And there's that story in the New Testament of Ananias and Sapphira, who simply uh, 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 exaggerated a bit the claim uh, of the, that they uh, were giving to having dedicated a certain amount of land to God. And uh, because they were pretending to a bit more of dedication than they really possessed, they died before the Lord. Now, why? What do you think about these things? I think a lot of us reading the Bible tend to feel something and then pass on, and we never analyze it any further. And this is why many people reading the Old Testament come up with the idea that God in the Old Testament is a God of vengeful judgment, that he's a fierce and harsh tyrant, and that the slightest uh, misstep is treated with condign judgment. And we tend to think of God in that way, especially the God of the Old Testament, despite the hundreds of passages that reveal the tenderness of God's heart and the, the glory of his love and the compassion in the Old Testament. But it's because we read our Bible so superficially now, God here is acting just as much as a God of love as he is in any other part of the Bible. His nature is love. And if we don't react that way, then it's something wrong with us. And we need to stop and 
search a bit and find out what it is behind here that helps us to understand it as being the actions of love and not of judgment or of fierceness. Now, there are certain things, I think, therefore, we have to look at in this passage to understand this that will help us. And the first thing is that it ought to be clearly noted that this sin on the part of these two priests was not a sin of ignorance, but one of presumption. They knew better. It wasn't bec that they were simply uh, in, a, in, in ignorance, uh, doing something that they had no idea God would be offended at. It was that they had been told clearly that he would be offended. If you look back at Exodus 30, for instance, you find in the, in that chapter a description of the, of the making of the altar of incense, where the incense was to be burned. We'll not read the whole chapter, but in the midst of it, in verse 7, we're told, and Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps in the evening, he shall burn it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. And then in verse 9, you shall offer no unholy incense thereon. Now that's clear. God had precisely said, be careful, do not offer the wrong kind of incense. So that when these priests uh, did this, they did so against the direct command of God. And they were doing something which God had himself warned about. You see, God never visits with judgment anybody who's struggling in ignorance to try to find him, even though they do it the wrong way. The New Testament quotes about the Lord Jesus, a beautiful word from Isaiah that says, smoking flax will he not quench, nor uh, uh, burning, uh, let's see, but a bruised reed will he not break, nor smoking flax he will not quench. That is, someone that's struggling and trying to find their way to God, trying to do what is right but doesn't know much about it, and maybe does it all wrong, God understands the heart, and he never, never in any way discourages that. He encourages it. He's tender and compassionate and understanding. But this is a sin, uh, obviously, of, of willful presumption. These priests just took it for granted that God wouldn't care about this. And even though he had said so, they gave no weight to his words, and they insisted on their own way in this. Therefore, it helps, I think, to understand it in that light. Now, the second thing that we need to note from this is that this is treated very severely because it distorted God's revelation of himself. That's why it was an important thing to, to take note of. Uh, God is, in all these priestly sacrifices and rituals, is explaining something about himself, that we might learn the kind of God that he is. And as these priests did this, they were distorting the revelation of God and teaching wrong truth about the being of God. That's why God judged it. You remember that's what Moses did. Remember in the wilderness when he was uh, leading the people on the way to the land, he, uh, they needed water, and he, uh, in obedience to God's word, he, spoke to the, he smote the rock, and water flowed forth. And then a second time this occurred, and God said to him this time, not to smite the rock, but to speak to it. But Moses, in his anger, smote the rock. And though God allowed the water to come forth as a... Uh, as a grace and mercy to the thirsting people of Israel. He said to Moses, you have, you have not sanctified me in the eyes of these people. You've taught wrong truth about me, and therefore you'll never enter the land. And God kept his word with Moses. Even though Moses was a great and mighty leader, God used him greatly after that. Still, Moses had lost his right to enter the land because he taught wrong things about God in some action like this. Now here we have this. 
You see, God had said that the kind of incense that was to be offered was a peculiar kind, frankincense. Now, frankincense never yields its fragrance until it's burned. And this is a very instructive uh, lesson for us. Uh, incense in the scriptures is always a picture of prayer. It's a beautiful picture of it, just as the clouds of incense arose in the evening air before the sanctuary. It was a picture to all the people of how our hearts and the thanksgiving and prayer of our hearts ascend before the, the, the God of glory. And it, it's intended to be a picture of the prayer and commitment arising out of a obedient and a thankful heart. But not merely thankful for just the ordinary blessings of life, but primarily thankful for the trials and the hardships and the things that burn us, that are difficult, the burning trials, the fiery trials that Peter mentions in his letter that we have to pass through, the ordeals of our life. And that's what God is trying to teach us that it's a sweet odor to him, it's a fragrant thing, it's a delight to him to see a heart that's filled with thanksgiving because of the trials they've passed through. And that uh, the heart that has learned to rejoice in the fact that God has given opportunities in, in these difficult times to manifest his character and has taught us great and painful lessons oftentimes about ourselves and about our lack of love through these trials, and thus is thankful for what they've learned. This is what delights the heart of God. Now, that's what God is trying to teach by the prescribed ritual of offering frankincense each evening and morning uh, by these priests. But that lesson is marred and changed, and we're taught a wrong truth about God by this offering of some other kind of perfume. What it taught, of course, was that uh, mere perfume of some other sort would teach that God exists only to make us feel good, that he is uh, uh, there just to produce a kind of a human happiness. Uh, if perfume is a picture of our happiness, of our thankful hearts, well, then whatever makes us temporarily happy is from God. And that is the great philosophy, which you know today, is destroying thousands, millions, the philosophy of hedonism. That is that anything that makes you happy is the reason for life. And that's the struggle. And it's the pursuit of happiness. And whatever produces any kind of temporary passing happiness must be right, because that's what God exists for. That's what we're here for. That's what's destroying so many today. Just just the idea of getting a temporary thrill by a shot in the arm with a needle or by losing a sense of the ugliness of life by in an alcoholic haze or retreating to some round of pleasure which helps you to forget and get away from things, makes you happy for a while. All these things must be right. And God exists because of that. But you see, that's a lie. The lie about God. That isn't what makes us happy. Happiness doesn't come from some momentary pleasure we're doing. Happiness comes from a relationship of freedom, of giving oneself to the God who made us, and thus being uh, able to experience our humanity for the very first time, perhaps, to many, as we learn to yield, to give up, to lose our lives, and thus find it again as Jesus has said. I don't think there's any more a beautiful picture in the whole Bible of what it means to offer strange fire before the Lord than that prayer that Jesus uh, recorded for us in the New Testament, the prayer of the, of the proud Pharisee. Remember how he stood and prayed and said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people. All these unwashed publicans out here I thank you that I'm not like them. I tithe every day, and I pr fast twice a week. And his prayer is just a recital of all that he's done for God, and how lucky God ought to be to have him on his side. 
Now, you see, that's, that's what's meant by offering strange fire before the Lord. Anything that reckons upon our own self-righteousness and forgets that life is given to us as a gift. We have no right to it at all. Perhaps the most basic form of sin is ingratitude, is this seizing of life as though we have a right to it, instead of taking it as a constant gift from a father's hand and giving thanks in that way. What a tremendous text this is for Thanksgiving week. We learn how to give thanks as God in such a way that will delight the heart of God and learn to rejoice in the fact that he's put us through trials and thus given us an opportunity to manifest his life. How are you ever going to show that God is the kind who, who uh, returns good for evil unless somebody does evil to you? How are you ever going to get a chance to return good for evil unless somebody hurts you? How are you ever going to demonstrate uh, that uh, the truth of the, of the scripture, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake unless somebody persecutes you? You see, the moment that happens, you have a chance to manifest the life of Jesus, the character that delights the heart of God. How are you ever going to learn the disciplines of life that break down your self-confidence and your trust in yourself and in human resources and teaches you to rely wholly upon a God who releases from within the strength you need unless you're put in trials where you cannot any longer meet it with your with adequate human resource, unless you're pushed out beyond your depth. How are you ever going to learn this unless that happens? But the great lesson that God is seeking to impart to us is this. How many verses of the New Testament say this to us? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, James tells us, because that's an opportunity to delight the heart of God by the reaction you show. And this is our priesthood. And if it's distorted, if we act as though only when things go right, do we give thanks to God? If we only uh, can uh, find it in our hearts to be grateful when everything's going well. You see, this is what anybody ought to do. Even non-Christians can do that. Even pagans react that way. But God is looking for those hearts that have genuinely learned to rejoice in the trials God has sent and the pain you've gone through and the difficulty, and the disappointments, and the circumstances of hardship. When you bow your head over your Thanksgiving table this week, are you just going to give thanks for the supply of food, and the adequate supply of raiment and clothing, and the house over your head, and the job you have, and the family around you, and the blessings of life? Or can you also thank God from a genuinely rejoicing heart that he's taught you some deep truths through painful circumstances. That you've had to go through some hardships and some crushing disappointments, but out of them you've seen yourself in a new way, and you've learned how to rest and draw upon the resources of an abundant Savior in your life. Well, you see, that's when God's heart begins to swell with pride and gladness, delight, the frankincense goes up before him as a sweet savor before his nostrils, and he delights in that. And this is what was being twisted and distorted by this whole performance of these two careless and thoughtless priests. Now, the third thing about this that we need to remember is that this judgment is exemplary. That is, God has made an example of them uh, once, and he never does this again. This isn't something that happens every time the priest violated anything. It only happens once at the beginning of the priesthood here. Just as the sin of Ananias and Sapphira in the early church was a sin that was common among Christians and has been common ever since, but God's never visited it in death again, physical death like that. 
God's teaching a lesson by this. And so he only does it once. But it's important that it happened at least that one time. Later on, you can read in the priesthood of Israel how the priests did very many terrible things in front of the altar, and God never, never killed them for it. Even in the days of the Maccabees, there's a time when they offered, actually offered swine's blood on the altar, an unclean animal, which was a horrendous thing to do. And yet there's no record of God's judgment there. But this, you see, is an example. And therefore, it's a, it's a way of, it's a manifestation of God's love and concern. He's trying to stop this kind of thing from happening anymore. I was very struck a few weeks ago in reading in Life magazine the uh, story of Mi Lai and uh, the account of the terrible atrocities that occurred out there. And in it, uh, the magazine uh, quoted a le Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Herbert, who is a 23-year-old veteran who is the Army's most decorated soldier out of the Korean War and who put his career on the line to protest the passive attitudes of many senior officers toward cruelty and killing and other atrocities in the army. And he said this about the Milai killings. This stuff would stop, he said, if we'd hang a couple of senior commanders. If it's no longer condoned, then it will cease. If you don't tell a soldier what's right, then he thinks whatever is tacitly condoned is what you want. And that's what he does. And you see, that's the way we human beings work. Unless something is vividly, dramatically, openly, symbolically made clear to us, we'll go right on and do these things. So God is stopping that. He's arresting it with this judgment at this point. And then the last thing that we need to remember about this, I think that will help us to understand it in a different light, is there's no implication here of the eternal condemnation of Nadab and Abihu. This doesn't mean they're lost. These two young priests, I think, were in glory immediately. God took them home, not because uh, he was going to condemn them to hell, but because they had violated their ministry. And he called them back home as an as a example to others that they should not violate it in the same way, and especially in the reality of which what they were doing was merely the symbol. And this is what it's telling us is, how do you and I do this? Well, you see, we can offer strange fire before God in our priesthood. We do that whenever we depart from the word of the Lord concerning what we tell others, the advice we give in the, in the priesthood that we exercise. This is the one thing that's pointed out here. These two priests did what the Lord commanded not. And that's what we do. Somebody comes and asks for help or advice. Maybe they're going through a difficult time and uh, they've been uh, mistreated personally, insulted. And if you and I say, as we're so tempted to say, well, uh, you know, if I were there, I'd punch him in the nose. That's offering strange fire before the Lord, isn't it? That isn't what God said. He says, return good for evil. Now, I don't mean that there isn't a time when we may be angry and, and even exercise physical violence on behalf of someone else, but never on behalf of ourselves. This is what God calls us to. And you see, we can be guilty of this kind of thing. That's what God is teaching us, that what we, must, what we offer as a priest must be that which is commanded of the Lord and not anything else. Now the next section reveals a very human reaction on the part of Aaron and his two sons. We read Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uzziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Draw near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they drew near and carried them in their coats, 
out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar his son, Do not let the hair of your heads hang loose, and do not rend your clothes, lest you die, and lest wrath come upon all the congregation. But your brethren, the whole house of Israel, may bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. And do not go out from the door of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did, according to the word of Moses. You can bet they would. <laughs> it must have been, again, a tremendous struggle for them to watch to watch their cousins summoned and have to go in and pick up these charred and singed bodies and carry them out in their coats, bury them. Naturally, their hearts were torn. This was sudden. These were their brothers and Aaron's sons. He loved them. And their natural reaction would be to take the rest of the day off at least, mourn them, weep for them. But Moses said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You can't do that. God won't let you. If, you. if you do that, you'll die. But God wants you to stay right with the priesthood, despite the feeling of your own heart. For God knew what we do not know, know that out of that, that shock, out of that pain, out of that anguish of heart would come a new power and a new efficiency and a new sense of purpose for their priesthood. And so he wouldn't let them off. He said, let the rest of Israel bewail them. But you stay right on the job. Don't you quit. Have you ever felt like that? You ever felt like quitting? I have, lots of times. If I were in these two boys' shoes, I'd have thought to myself, how do you get out of this outfit? <laughs> I never counted on anything like this. If you make a mistake, and of course it wasn't that, but if you do something deliberately and you're not, uh, you're not careful to do what God says, this can happen to you. And I would have said, I'm quitting. But God sent Moses to warn, say, you can't do it. And I've come to the place lots of times where I felt like that. I don't want to help others anymore, Lord. It's too great a responsibility. I want out. Just let me alone. Just let me live my, by myself. And God says no, because he knows that your priesthood and my priesthood will be all the richer because of his discipline. That's why we read in Hebrews 12, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor rebuke, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. Don't set it aside. Don't despise it. For out of the pain of your heart will come a clearer understanding and a deeper compassion and a stronger word of help to someone else. God knows that. And he won't let us off. Now, I hope you take these words seriously, because God means them seriously. He's not joking when he says to us today, believers in Jesus Christ, that each one of us is called to a priesthood. For some reason, we have a tendency to just blind our uh, eyes and shut our ears to this kind of thing and say, well, that belongs to somebody else. No, it doesn't. It belongs to you. You have a priesthood. God has called you to it. There are no exceptions. If I'm in the ministry, so are you in the ministry. If I have a responsibility to help my brother, my sister, whoever I meet along the way, so have you. And your priesthood is to be exercised right where you are, in your office, in your shop, school, home, with your children, with your neighbors, your friends. God looks at you in your busy business office and he isn't noting what you're noting. He isn't concerned about what you're concerned about. You're concerned about getting the work done and doing it in such an acceptable manner that they'll keep paying you a check at the end of the month. 
God doesn't worry about that particularly. He wants that done. That's part of your ministry. But the main thing that God wants, and what he's watching in you is how you react to the people you work with. What are you doing in return to what they do to you? How are you responding to the way they treat you? That's what God's watching. And that's your opportunity for priesthood. That's your opportunity for ministry. One of these days, God will call us all to account for our ministry, for our priesthood. And he'll ask us, what did you do in this situation and that? How did you respond? Here's an opportunity for you to be a priest. And what did you do? What are you going to say? What am I going to say? God takes this very seriously, and he lays this upon us, and he won't let us off. No matter if our heart is breaking and we're going through pressures and struggles and trials and problems, he won't let us off. He, he says, you can't quit. I put you there to deepen your impact, to increase your opportunity, to broaden your ministry. And I won't let you off. Out of it will have to come a deeper and a richer commitment and an understanding of the word of the Lord and what you can say to people that will help them, not just pass on some piece of advice off the top of your head that reflects the philosophy of the world. That's the ministry. That's the priesthood to which God has called it. Now the rest of the chapter we're going to reserve for next time, but there are some very interesting and helpful uh, suggestions here on how to, con how to carry out our priesthood what to avoid. And also, the chapter ends with a marvelous manifestation of the, of the tenderness of God and the grace of God. And I hope you don't carry away from this study some sense of God now as a, as a vengeful and strange and fearsome being. He is to be respected. We can't trifle with him. Like the laws of nature, we can't just ignore them and do whatever we feel like doing. God's not that kind of being. But on the other hand, every action, even this kind of action, is an action of love. It's an attempt to arrest further destruction and to stop it before it begins and to keep us from hurting ourselves and harming others in the process. Let's bow together now in prayer. Our Father, as we wait before you on this, we, we too feel a sense of awe, a sense of uh, fear perhaps, a little touch of it in our heart, that you're this kind of a God, utter realist, you always deal realistically with everything. And Lord, we just pray that this will help us to understand that we are not playing games in life, that coming to church and being a Christian is not a game either, that it's a very serious matter to which we're called, and it involves us deeply and there's no way out. And our responsibility then is, is to be what you want us to be, Lord. Help us to do so. Help us to understand that you are understanding. And you're willing to help us at any time in our ignorance and our foolishness. We, we blindly walk off into, into dead end streets. You're willing to help us back, Lord. But you'll not put up with, with deliberate refusal to take seriously your word. That always involves us in difficulty. Help us to understand that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm praying God, come and turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything, yes. God, turn it around. God, turn it around, God, turn it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. I'm praying God, come 
and turn this thing around. Oh yes, God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. Oh yeah, yeah. God turn it. Around. All thrones and dominions 